Hi everyone, my name is Tom Pettit and welcome to this week's episode of Beyond Come Follow Me. This week in your Come Follow Me lessons, you are looking at the stories and the doctrine that is contained in two books of the Old Testament, the book of Ezra and the book of Nehemiah. And for a few minutes now, I'm excited to do what I do each week, and that is to just share with you the general storyline of what's going on. Understanding the storyline, I think, helps us find and relate better to the doctrine that's contained within those stories. And then, of course, I want to put in some church history stories. And this week, we talk a lot about the temple. Your Come Follow Me lesson focuses on the temple. These books follow, uh, focus on it. And so I'm going to do the same, sharing with you some unique and fun, really interesting stories about the first temple, the Kirtland Temple, and the building of it. Uh, as we follow some of the stories here of some of the Israelites being permitted back into Jerusalem to build the temple there. So I'll connect all those kind of dots uh, over the next few minutes as, as we enjoy spending some time in these two books from the Old Testament. Now the book of Ezra uh, opens up not with the man of Ezra. It actually starts talking about a man by the name of Cyrus. Now Cyrus is not an Israelite, not a member of the house of Israel. He's really a military leader most of his life and then he ends up being king. Well, Cyrus is a big deal. Uh, this is quite a notable individual for what he accomplished as far as his military career and his career as, as being king. Now, he started out and worked his way up the military ladder to where he started conquering a lot. Now, now let me just pause there and go back to last week's video. We had 10 of the tribes of Israel in the north, two of the tribes of Israel in the south. The Assyrians come in, they conquer. Uh, they start to scatter Israel, as I talked about in the last week's video. The Babylonians come in and they they conquer and, and have problems with Assyri the Assyrians as they start to crumble. And then Cyrus comes in and kind of takes over everything. As I said, he works his way up the military chain of, of success. And all of a sudden, he's kind of the number one guy in all of East Asia. Uh, now, East Asia doesn't just take in the... the the Orient, and but it also comes down around the bottom, which was one, which was um, Thailand, Cambodia, but it also goes into the Middle East. All this area that we're talking about of Old Testament stories and where everything happened. So all the Old Testament lands, the Persian Gulf and Israel and Iraq and Iran and all those countries down in that area, but now he's spreading out all into East Asia as well. So yeah, he's a big, big deal. Uh, in the world history and how he ties in to the house of Israel not being a member of the house of Israel it's a miracle and uh, and the Lord being in charge of everything set it up just this way now I give you that little historical background about who this guy is and how much control and dominion and power he must have had because had he not been in that position then the Lord couldn't have used him to bless the house of Israel. Let me let me explain by giving you a couple of quotes from first from President Wilford Woodruff talking about this Cyrus guy. Now, he said Wilford says, "I have thought many times that some of those ancient kings that were raised up had in some respects more regard for the carrying out of some of these principles and laws than even the Latter-day Saints have in our day. I will make I will take as an example Cyrus to trace the life of Cyrus from his birth to his death, whether he knew it or not, it looked as though he lived by inspiration in all his movements. He began with the temp he began with that temperance and virtue which would sustain any Christian country or any Christian king. Many of these principles followed by him, and I have thought many of them were worthy in many respects the attention of men. Who have the gospel of Jesus Christ. God, the Father of us all, uses the men of the earth, especially good men. And of course, we'd include women. God uses the men and women of the earth, especially good men and women, to accomplish his purposes. It has been true in the past, it is true today, and it will be true in the future. So just because an individual might not be a member of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints doesn't mean that the Lord can't and won't use that individual to further his purposes. This is what he did with Cyrus. 
Now, Ezra Taft Benson, he had the same opinion. He says, King Cyrus lived more than 500 years before Christ and figured in prophecies of the Old Testament mentioned in 2 Chronicles and in the book, and in, in the book of Ezra and by the prophets Ezekiel, Isaiah, and Daniel, all these biblical prophets were talking about this Cyrus. The Bible states how, quote, the Lord stirred up the spirit of Cyrus, king of Persia. Cyrus restored certain political, and this is Ezra Taft Benson continuing, Cyrus restored certain political and social rights to the captive Hebrews, gave them permission to return to Jerusalem, and directed that Jehovah's temple should be rebuilt. So this book is called the book of Ezra. Ezra doesn't even show up until chapter, two, chapter 7. This is really about Cyrus and what Cyrus is doing for ancient Israel. So the Israelites were captured by the Babylonians. Cyrus comes in and conquers the Babylonians and then says, Hey, all, all of you scattered Israel? Uh, you can go back to Jerusalem if you want and, and keep working on that temple that you started working on or, or, or go and build the temple that you want to that you want to build. And so from leaders from Judah and also from Benjamin go and start the construction. Now this wasn't just, hey, sending out a temple committee. Bible scholars indicate that there was about 50,000 Israelites that were permitted to return to Jerusalem and to start building up the temple there in Jerusalem. Now let me connect this to the importance. So we see the importance in, in the Old Testament. They were, they were pulled away from uh, Jerusalem when they were scattered by the Babylonians. Cyrus restores them somewhat. He allow, at least allows them to be, or permits them to go back to build the temple. And then we get some of them going back. And, uh, and it's a big deal to the Israelites. They had somewhat forgotten who they were. This is going to help remind them who they are. And it makes me think of the importance of Latter-day temples when we think about the importance that this ancient temple was to the ancient Israelites. When Moroni appears at the bedside of the prophet Joseph Smith in September 1823, he talks about a few things very briefly. He introduces himself. He calls Joseph by name. He says, God has an important work for you to do, Joseph. Because of that important work, your name is going to be had for good and evil throughout all the world. And in a nearby hill is deposited on gold plates a record which contains the fullness of the everlasting gospel of Jesus Christ as delivered by him to the ancient inhabitants of this continent. And then that's it. That's all he wants to talk about in regards to who I am, who you are, the work that you're supposed to do, and the Book of Mormon. Joseph, we got through that in about five minutes. Set that aside the rest of the night. Let me talk to you about the temple and preparing for the second coming of the Lord. And Moroni says, he quotes the fifth, ver, uh, uh, the fifth verse from the book of Malachi. Uh, Behold, I will reveal unto you the priesthood by the hand of Elijah the prophet before the coming of the great and dreadful day of the Lord. And then Joseph says in Moroni, he also quoted the next verse differently, but in this way, and he shall plant the hearts of the children in the, excuse me, and he shall plant in the hearts of the children the promises made to the fathers. And the hearts of the children shall turn to their fathers. If it were not so, the whole earth would be utterly wasted at his coming. So Moroni spends all night talking to Joseph Smith about the temple. Well, what temple? There's no temple on the earth at the time. Not, not in 1823. Moroni was laying out the purpose of the restoration that is about to begin. Joseph, the reason we're going to go through this whole restoration process is for one reason. So that, so that the Latter-day Saints, the Latter-day House of Israel, can enjoy the blessings of the temple. So that we, as members of the church, can obtain the highest level of blessings and prepare for exaltation to live with our Heavenly Father someday by, by being able to attend and participate in ordinances that can only be obtained in temples that's the point of the restoration Moroni i say and, and i would too that everything that, that that joseph smith restored knowledge doctrine understanding priesthood authorities priesthood keys priesthood power 
and now the temple and the temple ordinances and of course the translation of the Book of Mormon and the obtaining of revelations containing the Doctrine and Covenants, everything leading and pointing us to the Savior. And the only way to ultimately return to the Savior is by getting on and going down and staying on that covenant path that President Hinckley continues to talk, uh, talk about so frequently. So Joseph, that's in 1823. Eventually, he gets the Book of Mormon. He translates it. He publishes it. The church is organized officially April 6, 1830. Send missionaries out. Joseph gets the commandment in the Doctrine and Covenants, go to the Ohio, and there I will give unto you my law and endow you with power from on high. Again, talking about the temple. So Joseph goes to Kirtland, Ohio, and they start to build the temple. Well, Joseph, he doesn't know what a temple is. And even if he did, he doesn't know what to do with the temple. Not at this point. And so he kind of ignores, well, he doesn't ignore the, the, but he puts off, certainly puts off the commandment from the Lord to get started on this temple. Well, he's busy doing other things. And that's a good enough excuse, he supposes, for a little while for not getting started on this temple, which he doesn't know how to build or what to do with it once it is built. But the Lord keeps after him. He says, Joseph, you have got to get going on this temple. So he gathers up a big group of individuals who he trusts, and he says, look, the Lord's commanding us to build a temple. Anybody have any ideas? And one individual said, Joseph, we're really good at building log cabins. We can take care of this thing quick. And another guy says, well, you know, the log cabin, that's nice, but, you know, we also know how to build wood frame homes. Let's just build a big one. We're good at that, too. We can even make it two-story, paint it white. It'll look great. And the conversations continue on like this until finally Joseph gets a little frustrated. He says, brother, you don't understand. We're not building a home for man. We are building a temple to our God. And he dismissed the meeting. He's left alone in his office in the upper floor of the Newell K. Whitney store. And he's just there with his first presidency. He's there with Sidney Rigdon and Frederick G. Williams. And the three of them start discussing, what are we supposed to do with this commandment to build the temple? Frederick G. Williams says in his journal that he saw the vision at that point first. And then he pointed it out to the other two. Out the window on the hill where the temple is today, they see the temple in vision. And then Frederick G. Williams says that all of a sudden they were outside the temple. They were walking around and they were able to examine the Kirtland Temple in all of its glory and majesty. And then he says that they, the eyes of their understanding were open and they were able to comprehend the whole of it. In other words, they didn't have to pull out a tape measure to know the width and the depth and the height or the length and the height. They didn't need to take down notes of where the windows were supposed to be and the shape of them and how many window panes there were to be and exactly how this was to be. And he said, as soon as we comprehended the whole of it, we were transported inside the temple and we walked through the whole thing. They knew where the choir boxes were to be. They knew all about the pulpits and the positioning of those pulpits. They knew how many pews there were going to be and the floors and the different everything, all the details of the Kirtland Temple. And now Joseph had it. He got it up there. He didn't have a blueprint, not on paper, but he knew it in his mind. So he gets that group of men back together and he says, okay, I, the Lord revealed it to me, exactly what this temple is supposed to look like. And he starts to describe it. And while he's describing it, he's kind of distracted. There's a noise behind him. He turns around and there's his good brother, Hiram Smith. He's got one of those sickles and he's hacking at the weeds right there where the temple is. I, I forgot to tell you, they gathered on the top of the hill at the spot where they saw and envisioned the temple was to be. And Hiram is tearing down the weeds and interrupting the meeting. Joseph turns around to him and says, brother, what are you doing? And he says, if we're going to build a temple here, I'm going to be the first to start on it. That was the enthusiasm of Hiram Smith. Well, Joseph says, brother, I love you, but we don't even own this property yet. <laughs> it still belonged to some old farmer. They had to work out a, a payment arrangement to, to uh, purchase the property. But that would come later. So then they, they, they're still there at the temple site, or what will be the temple site, or the, what will be the site of the temple. And Joseph says, okay, brother, and so I've described it to you. Anybody know how to build this thing? Lorenzo Young finally raises his hand. He says, Joseph, I don't know how to build this, but I know a man who does. His name's Artemis Millet. He's up in Canada, and he could build a temple like this, but he's not a member of the church. Joseph Smith, without even responding to Lorenzo Young, he turns to Brigham Young, and he says, Brigham, I give unto you a mission. You're to go to Canada. You're to find Artemis Millet, preach him the gospel, and 
convert him to the gospel, bring him to Kirtland, and have him help us build the temple. Brigham Young says, okay. He turns and walks out of the meeting to go pack his bags and walk 300 miles to, to Canada. And as he's walking out away from the meeting headed towards home, Joseph Smith, in almost an afterthought, he calls out. He says, hey, Brigham, uh, one more thing. Um, after you convert to Artemis Millet um, and invite him and his family to move to Kirtland, I want you to have him sell everything and tell him to bring $1,000 with him and donate it to the church. Now, $1,000 back then was a whole lot of money. Comparative, comparatively to today's dollars, it would have been tens of thousands of dollars. So Brigham Young says, 1000 bucks, no problem. And he's out of there, off to Canada. He finds Artemis Millet, preaches him the gospel. He and his family accept the gospel. They desire to be baptized. Brigham then tells him, we need a temple built, and we understand you can do it. And Artemis says, show me the way to Kirtland. He sells all of his, his personal property, his businesses, and everything else that he had. He walks to Kirtland, 300 miles with his family, meets the prophet Joseph, hands him a $1,000 and says, I want to donate this money to the building of the Kirtland Temple, but I want to donate my time, my skill, my, my talents to the actual construction. And so he got to work on it. Here's a man who knew exactly how to build the temple the way that it had been revealed to the prophet Joseph Smith. So temples in the Old Testament, in the book of Ezra, is a big deal to these people. In Kirtland, it was a big deal, not just to Joseph in the First Presidency and Artemis and Brigham and the rest of them, but to all the saints. They all gave what they could. Some a lot, some a little. Well, a few gave a lot because they had it. But many, many gave what we would say is a little, but in reality, it was a lot because they gave all that they had. They gave that widow's might. And so here in that dispensation, in this dispensation, the excitement and the thrill of the temple is, is bubbling over. And I'm going to show you here at the end of this video some quotes from President Nelson that hopefully will get our excitement for the temple to start bubbling over. As I talk to you about the blessings that President Nelson promises those who attend the temple. All right, so this gets us into Ezra chapter 3 now. And the temple is, is being rebuilt. They first start with the altar. And then after they get the altar built and in place, they start immediately offering sacrifice. They don't wait for the whole temple to be built. Let's get going right now. It's like the Nauvoo Temple. They built the baptismal font and dedicated it. And then while baptisms for the dead are being performed in that font, the rest of the temple is being built. Then they built a ceiling room, dedicated it while they're still building the rest of it. It got dedicated in, in pieces as it became available. Seems that's the way that this temple in Jerusalem is being built as well. They built the altar, didn't want to wait any longer before they start worshiping uh, the Lord and so they st by, by offering sacrifices. The second step was to lay the foundation. Of course, like any good building, they put out the foundation. And as soon as the foundations are laid, then they pause in the construction for a moment to celebrate to praise the Lord. They bring in music. They have a celebration of sorts. And that's what we do today. We have a groundbreaking ceremony for every new temple. Uh, what's become a tradition and very popular is to have uh, the night before the, cel the dedication is a celebration, typically a youth celebration where they're singing and dancing and the, and the cultural, cult the cultural events uh, that are... Um, native to the to the locations that the temples are being built uh, that, that that's just becoming part of the whole dedicatory process of the temples and it, that's nothing new that's what they're doing in the old testament and, and it's it's just fantastic if we go to chapter 12 in the book of ezra chapter 3 we find <clears throat> this verse and i love this verse this is so cool because remember before Judah and Benjamin got separated, got scattered. They were in Jerusalem. Then they got carried away. They were in, in captivity. And then this mighty King Cyrus, he releases them. And they're able to go back to Jerusalem and now start building the temple. In verse 12, they're talking about those who remember. Who remember what it was like before the Babylonians came and took us over. And now for them to be returning 
the author of this book tries to describe that emotion. In verse 12, but many of the priests and Levites and the chief of their father of the fathers who were ancient men. You look at the footnote, ancient meaning old. So the old people in the group, them, those that had seen the first house when the foundation of this house was laid before their eyes. So those who remembered, and it had been, uh, if I recall, it's about 70 years. So these were the old timers that could remember before and now after the present day. When they knew, when they saw that the house was being built, the temple was being built, what did they do? They wept with a loud voice and many shouted aloud for joy. Seems like every six months at General Conference, we get that same experience. You hear President Nelson up there at the pulpit, and he's reading off a list of, of new temple uh, locations where new temples are going to be built. And what do you hear out of the crowd sometime? Some some people that just can't contain themselves any longer. They they that's their hometown, that's their city. They're in Salt Lake, but they're going home to the very location where a temple is going to be built. And I don't know if they try to contain themselves and can't, or if they irreverently just shout for joy. Either way, you hear noise in the conference center of people just filled with excitement and joy and the emotions just coming out that wow a temple in my hometown and they weep for joy they or they weep with a loud voice and they and they shout for joy just like these individuals did I, i'm making a point of this not because of, not only because i love that that verse and that description but wait until I connect this with President Nelson's promises here in just a moment. And, uh, and all of us, when we hear and understand and have a testimony of the blessings that are promised to us that are found only in the temple, we too should and we would weep with a loud voice and we would shout aloud for joy as well. These, these ancients, these old people who could remember the way it was, and seeing the return of the temple blessings. We can relate to that. Don't forget what happened in 2020. How could you? COVID hit. And just like that, every temple in the world was shut down. The lights turned off. The curtains drawn over the windows if they have them. The doors locked. And when the temple would open up again, nobody knew. We had no idea. And as the temples rolled out, you know, in phase one and then phase two, and then oh, let's, let's do a phase two B, which is totally awesome, and then phase three. And my understanding is nearly every temple, if not all, are now back to phase four. But as we anticipated and looked and watched anxiously, are we going to be phase two this week are we going to get to phase b phase 2b and we anticipated the reopening and then as those temples started to reopen maybe not physically but certainly many people physically and if not at least inwardly we wept aloud and shouted for joy as those temples started to reopen again and if you experienced that you'll have an easier what um, opportunity to answer this question than, than if, if you didn't. But if you did go through that process of regularly attending the temple, and then all of a sudden it's taken away from us, and we have no idea when we'd ever go back to the temple, just hoping and trusting we would. And then when that day happened, when we could go back to the temple, and you went back for the first time, in ten, after a 10 month absence, 12 month absence, 14, I think it was, I think it was 15 or 16 month absence for me and, and where I live. Um, did we go back? Did you go back with a, sh a loud shout of joy and weeping for happiness and gratitude for the opportunity to go back to the temple? We did. I remember it, and I remember being in the temple and seeing people physically 
go through what's described in, in verse 12 there. But how do we keep that love for the temple alive? How do we, how do we keep that desire and that anxiety to go to the temple at a super high level, at a 2021 level? instead of slipping back into the 2019 level where it was a routine thing that we just put on our calendar. You see the difference? 2019, yeah, we just go to the temple. You know, this is kind of what we do. 2020, it's taken away. 2021, wow. We feel it. We love it. We anticipate it. We want it. We do anything we can to go. And now we're into 2022. Where's our temple attitude. Is it a 2019 attitude or a 2021 attitude? It makes me think of Alma when he's preaching in chapter 5, Alma 5 verse 26. He says, And now behold, I say unto you, my brethren, if you have experienced a change of heart, if you have felt a sing the song of redeeming love, I would ask, can you feel so now? And if you felt that way, the way that it's being described in Ezra chapter 3 verse 12, where we wept with a loud voice and we shouted aloud for joy in 2021 when we got our temples back? Can we feel so now? As Alma asks. If we felt that way in 2021, do we still feel that way? Or do we feel more like we did back in 2019? Those are good questions, I think. Well, it takes us to Ezra chapter 4. Ezra chapter 4, the temple's being built, but the Samaritans, they don't like that so much. So they start to frustrate the building of the temple. Verse 4 and 5, and the people of the land, they weakened the hands of the people of Judah. Weakened it. You take a look at the footnote there. What in the world does that mean? And it means that they discouraged the people. They slowed them down. They became a stumbling block. And the work on the temple um, de decreased. And then in verse 5, they hired counselors against them. So they hired these people to go out, and I don't know what they hired them to do. Was it to protest? Was it just to get in their way? Was it to steal their tools? Or was it to act like lawyers and try to go through a legal system to, per, to legally prevent them from moving forward? I don't know. But anyway, they hired individuals to do what? To frustrate the purposes, to frustrate the building of the temple. Uh, and then they wrote a letter to the king. Telling the king, hey, you, you shouldn't let this continue on. You know, all these negative things, it's not good for you. It's not good for us. Let's, let's make them knock it off. And so the king, he agreed, and the work on the temple stopped. And in verse 24 of chapter 4, Then ceased the work of the house of God, which is at Jerusalem. So it ceased unto the second year of the reign of King Darius of Persia. So thus ceased the work of the temple. How did the people of the tribes of Judah, the tribes of Benjamin, those who were anxiously putting the temple back together that were building it, how did they feel? The same way you did in 2020. So now the Old Testament's not some old ancient record about some old ancient people that, you know, whatever, they lived a long time ago. We know how they felt. They know how we felt. We're just like them because they went th through things like we went through. So according to your biblical scholars, uh, the work stopped for about 15 to 17 years. And we were out of a temple for about 12 to 16 months. These guys were out for up to 17 years. It's heartbreaking. Chapter 5 of Ezra. They get some permission to start rebuilding. They come and start, start rebuilding. The Samaritans, they challenge again. That's interesting. These Samaritans. There's only one thing we know of, uh, of about the Samaritans, really, you know, unless we really study the Bible. And that is, we've, we've heard of that word, the Samaritans, the Good Samaritan. There's one Good Samaritan, right? The Good Samaritan, we know his story. And these folks, they're not being really Good Samaritans right now, are they? So they challenge again. And now the new king, chapter in chapter 6 of the book of Ezra, the new king, Darius, He's thinking, okay, there's got to be some precedent here. How did this all begin? I don't want to go back on something that I shouldn't. So they start looking through the books, and they find that good king, Cyrus, that he had written down in a book that, yeah, we're going to send some of these people back to Jerusalem and let them build. 
And not only that, but we're going to send some gold and silver, some things to order to make the temple beautiful. And we're going to supply them with the things that they need in order to build the temple. And Darius uh, reads this and he's like, hey, if that king uh, gave them permission, then I really don't have the right to rescind this executive order. So let's let's let it continue. And so the Samaritans are out of the way and uh, the temple is able to continue to, to be rebuilt. I want to just make quick mention here. Uh, chapter 6, a couple of verses here. Verse 7. So here Darius is, is uh, writing a letter. Let the work of this house of God alone. Knock it off, Samaritans. Just leave it alone. Let the governor of the Jews and the elders of the Jews build this house of God in his place. And then I love the way he concludes his letter, the last part of verse 12. Let it be done with speed. Darius, to some degree, gets it. Not only are we going to allow them to build this temple, but Darius says, let's, let's give them the tools, the supplies, whatever they need in order to get this, not only get this done, but to get it done and get it done quickly. It's awesome. Um, and then we get into verse uh, um, 7 and 12, which I just read. Uh, and then after that, the temple is built. They have some big time celebrations. They are thrilled to be able to go to the temple. And then finally, this guy named Ezra shows up. It's not until the seventh chapter. But Ezra's here now, great guy, and he is heading up to Jerusalem to meet with the people. And, and, hell, and, and the temple's been built, and now we've got uh, verse 10. What's Ezra going to do? I want to break it into two parts, talk about the second part of verse 10, and focus the rest of these last few minutes of this video on the first half. So it says, uh, Ezra chapter 7, verse 10, For Ezra had prepared his heart to seek the law of the Lord, and to do it, and to teach in Israel statutes and judgments. So first, like in the Doctrine and Covenants, it says, first, obtain to, uh, first seek to obtain my word, and then if you have desires, you shall preach my word. So you can't just go out and, and preach. you gotta, you got to prepare. you got to go to mission prep. you got to go to the MTC in those sorts of cases. Uh, for any church calling that's issued to us by a member of a bishopric or a stake presidency, um, the call isn't just handed out and say, okay, good luck, go to work. We're able to sit there with them and counsel, okay, how do you want me to do this? Um, what do I need to do to prepare? What sort of information can I obtain on my own in order to be able to be the best I can and to magnify this calling? So there's a process. There's a preparatory before you do the work, or a preparation before you do the work. And Ezra went through that. So now he's he has a desire and he's going to end up teaching Israel the statutes and judgments. What are the statutes and judgments? We find that in Article of Faith number three. It's the same thing, statutes and judgments. We believe in the laws and ordinances of the gospel of Jesus Christ. No, Article of Faith number three. We believe that through the atonement of Jesus Christ, all mankind may be saved by obedience to the laws and ordinances of the gospel. So what's Ezra going to go teach? The atonement of Jesus Christ, making available the laws and the ordinances of the gospel. And it all ties back to the temple. We need to do those things in order to get on the covenant path. We need to do those things to stay on the covenant path. We need to do those things to move forward down the covenant path. And Ezra's going to help the Israelites do that. So, be, But before he can do that, now let's reverse back to the top of verse 10. Before he's able to do that, he's got to do his preparatory work. For Ezra had prepared his heart. Heart. What is that? Mean? I'd like to read you a quote from Elder David A. Bednar. He's talking about preparing our hearts or having a, a pure heart, but also talking about clean hands. That often goes together, have clean hands and a pure heart. And so speaking of both, he says, Let me suggest that hands are made clean through the process of putting off the natural man and by overcoming sin and the evil influences in our lives through the Savior's atonement. Hearts are purified as we receive His strengthening power to do good and become better. 
all of our worthy desires and good works, as necessary as they are, can never produce clean hands and a pure heart. It is the atonement of Jesus Christ that provides both a cleansing and redeeming power that helps us overcome sin, and a sanctifying and strengthening power that helps us to become better than we ever could by relying only upon our own strength. The infinite atonement is for both the sinner and the saint in each of us. That's the end of the quote. I love that whole quote. And if you if, if you want to hear it and break it down, just keep hitting re the rewind button on this video and hear that over and over again. But he's describing, now he doesn't, he's not speaking directly about Ezra, but we're just connecting. Ezra prepared his heart. And Elder Bednar teaches exactly what each of us can do and what each of us needs to do in order to prepare our hearts as well and why do we want to have a prepared heart prepared for what to be receptive to be receptors of the cleansing and redeeming power that comes through the atonement of jesus christ Still speaking of the temple, I'd like to quote from President Nelson. He says, The temple lies at the center of strengthening our faith and spiritual fortitude, because the Savior and His doctrine are the very heart of the temple. Everything taught in the temple, through instruction and through the Spirit, increases our understanding of Jesus Christ. His essential ordinances bind us to Him through sacred priesthood covenants. Then, as we keep our covenants, he endows us with his healing, strengthening power. He said that in the October uh, 2021 General Conference. Now, the Lord, in my opinion, is making it so easy for each of us to obtain these blessings that the ancient Israelites desperately desired to have. These temple blessings that President Nelson tells us that we, we need to have as well. and. It's the same temple blessings that the Lord is wanting to give anyone who's willing does by doing the preparatory work as Elder Bednar described that, that to be. So he's what's the Lord doing to make it easy for us? A lot easier than the ancient Israelites. Well, he's putting temples everywhere. There's temples going. Now, I know, I, I don't know where you're from. If you're from Utah and you can see seven or eight temples on your commute to work or if you live in some part of the world where where you long to see the temple maybe once or twice a year but either way the lord is is helping to make it possible for us to be in the temple more frequently by scattering more and more temples throughout the world they've set up the system now where you can make an appointment online no longer are the days of showing up on a friday night here in Utah at least, to the temple, and waiting two to three hours in line before getting into a temple endowment session. No, because now you've got an appointment, you've got a reservation, you just walk right in. And, uh, and for those who don't have an appointment, they've now opened it up to saying, well, if you don't have an appointment, come anyway, and we'll see if we can fit you in. We've also got shorter times in the temple. As, the, as President Nelson announced not long ago that the temple ordinances would, would be refined to focus more on the Savior, not to focus more, but to make it make make the Savior more easily seen in in each of the temple ordinances. And by doing so, it's actually cut down on some of the, the time that it takes to get through an ordinance. And when you go to schedule your appointment, man, you can start a, you can schedule your appointment super early, all day into well into the late night. So it's just becoming the lord is providing more and more opportunities for us to take more and more advantage of attending the temple and so what's our our response with the lord's giving so much we need to up our commitment to respond and, and to say thank you lord we're, we're going to grab hold of these wonderful blessings you're giving us we need to recommit to go to the temple and go more more frequently uh, my brother and speaking uh, at the conclusion of his mission, I remember him talking about the temple 
and <clears throat> he was talking about the wonderful blessings of attending the temple. But then he, he gave this side thought. I don't think it was even in his notes. He was just inspired to say it. And here, 20 years later, I still remember it. He says, uh, he says, you know, if you can't go inside the temple right now, go to the temple grounds. And then he pointed out a fact. He said, when temples are dedicated, they don't just dedicate the building, but listen to the temple dedicatory prayer. The, the, the prophet or the, or the one who's doing the dedic, dedic, saying the dedicatory prayer will also dedicate the temple grounds. And so you can go to the temple grounds and feel the spirit, feel the closeness with the Lord. The temple blesses anybody who, who walks on the property, uh, whether you get through the doors or not. Um, and, and it's just uh, that's just a true statement. I, I remember I appreciate him saying that and, and teaching me that. Uh, a couple of blessings given by prophets and apostles. Tom, Thomas S. Monson said, As we enter through the doors of the temple, we leave behind us the distractions and confusion of the world. Uh, blessing number one right there. Inside this sacred sanctuary, we find beauty and order. There is rest for our souls and respite from the cares of our lives. Elder Renlin said, The blessings of the temple have a stunning capacity to heal. Temple blessings can heal hearts and lives and families. And then I'll conclude with President Nelson's promise to each of us. My dear brothers and sisters, construction of these temples may not change your life, but your time in the temple surely will. In that spirit, I bless you to identify those things you can set aside so that you can spend more time in the temple. That's the Come Follow Me lesson for the books of Ezra and Nehemiah. And uh, the things I've shared with you, I know it'd be true. The testimony that I've shared, I say in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen.